I, it was last year at Sage Days here in June that William was just getting wound up with the Sage Math Cloud. And he's been working real hard the last year, I know, especially on infrastructure. So he's going to give us an update on what's happening with the Sage Math Cloud. Some of you may be aware that in his free time, William's an avid skateboarder. And he's being videographed for a skateboarding documentary as part of what he does in his real job. So that's why we've got all the cameras today. So take it away, William. Great, thanks. All right, so this is a talk about SageMath Cloud, which is a project that uh, will give you the history, then I'll give you a demo, and then I'll talk about some uh, technical issues um, involving the front end, the back end, and say a few things about where things may be going. So first, here's a brief history of SageMath Cloud. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of background that goes before this involving uh, making Sage accessible over the web. That goes back um, to 2006, and I'm not going to talk about that. I'm specifically talking about SageMath Cloud, which I'll henceforth call SMC, which doesn't save any syllables at all, but it's easier to fit in your head. <laughs> So I started thinking about this project, the SMC project, in May 2012 when I visited the Simons Foundation. And they inspired me to try to find alternative sources of funding outside of the Simons Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I started thinking about ways to hopefully, so right now Sage, the project, has um, a few people that are working kind of part-time at, uh, you know, around $15 an hour, you know, nothing like a professional software engineer gets paid. And uh, we have zero people, we've never once had like, a full-time position ever since the project started, and that has hobbled us in various ways. Um, in contrast, if you look at, say, Wolfram, they have 600 people, um, some proportion of which are working as full-time software engineers, or MathWorks, they have over 2,000 employees. So. There's a huge amount of resources with these other projects, and also even Magma has a has like six or seven full-time employees. So the budget is extremely asymmetric, and that does hold us back in certain ways. So I would hope that there's some alternative source of funding. Um, we'll see. Um, so in 2012, I started thinking about this, and coincidentally, I think um, Fernando Perez and some other people started thinking about trying to get funding for IPython. And they've been very successful in getting funding from um, Moore and Sloan. In any case, um, during 2012 to 2013, uh, I did a lot of research about writing modern web applications and um, highly scalable and highly available web applications. Um, things had changed a lot. I had done a lot of this research back in 2006 and in 2008, and web technology had advanced um, a very impressive amount from 2008 to 2013. Uh, basically, I don't know, everything that I'm doing in SMC, almost none of it was possible in 2006. And in 2008, it was sort of, I mean, all this stuff was ridiculously hard back then. And a lot of things now are, are amazingly easy. Like just, if you wanted to just draw a little line somewhere on the page without just making an image and displaying it, it was incredibly hard. Um, every single thing just sucked back in 2006. Uh, but now, today, it's amazing. We have things like WebSockets so that can make persistent, robust connections between a browser and a server and so on. So I was really happy with that. Um, another thing, I, after spending months of writing code in Python for back-end server type stuff, I came to the conclusion, personally, I'm not the only person that's ever come to this conclusion, that Python's not the best possible language for every possible problem. Um, and I'm not writing much uh, SageMath Cloud using Python. Um, it's really good for the administrative coordination type stuff, but um, there are a lot of things for which it isn't the optimal tool. Um, so I deleted a large amount of code uh, that I'd written. Um, it's just not very good for asynchronous type stuff. Uh, so in 2013, I created some early prototypes of what would eventually be SMC. It wasn't named SMC then. Um, everything looked a lot different. Um, and I just got some people to try it out at ISERM and at the Sage Days in Hawaii. Um, this guy, Kartek, spent a lot of time trying to write code and use 
uh, the predecessor to SMC in Hawaii, and I watched how he did things, and or rather how he tried to abuse the interface I had carefully designed, and then change the interface to be much more like what he really wanted. For example, um, I'll show you a demo of SMC in a minute, but like terminals and stuff were kind of like there was a big margin on each side, and there's no way to like control the colors, and so he would you know spend a lot of time trying to make his browser really big and then shoving it to the side with a big margin off the side of the uh, desktop, and so obviously you see that. You want it, um, to use the real estate of your browser a lot better. So there are a lot of little things like this that I just saw by watching people. And then I redid the UI. In 2013 in March over spring break, um, I basically just had this very long two week coding binge. I skipped a Sage Days that I was planning to go to in Portland and instead worked on implementing uh, the first version of SMC. So it was one of those things where I basically I made a long list of all the tasks necessary for a first usable version of this for a course I was going to teach. And I estimated the time of every task and, and the m number of hours in the next 14 days, minus six hours a day to sleep, and then just scheduled it and worked my ass off and drank a lot of coffee. Um, and at the end, I did most of the things. Um, so that's where it came from. And more or less from that moment until now, it's been just fixing bugs, polishing it. The actual look is pretty similar to how it was then and adding various features like LaTeX editing, IPython notebooks, et cetera, that fit into the same overall design. Um, and that will continue in the future. Um, so as I mentioned here, later on after that, so initially, the first thing that was running had, as far as the back end, it had a single point of failure. The entire thing was running in one VM. Um, and it was on one VM on a Mac in my office. So it was easily taken down. Of course, there were only 40 users, the students in my class which helped a lot, um, and it was missing a lot of features that one would want. So um, I added some features like LaTeX editing and synchronized IPython notebooks because I just could tell there was a lot of demand for that sort of thing. And um, then amazingly painful and long period of time was really November 2013 through April 2014. So that's quite a bit of time. Um, some of the most stressful time of my life was in the recent year. But basically I went from well, first we went from having 40, well, zero users to, um, like right now there's almost 40,000 accounts and there are quite a few users or actual people using it. Um, like every day, well over a thousand people use it. And so um, that put a lot more of uh, stress on the system. And I also wanted to avoid, um, I wanted to make it so if any machine failed or even any data center failed, that people could continue using their projects. So. Um, there are a lot of issues where things fail. So for example, in Padelford one day, the switches that we have just all failed. And so then suddenly, you know, I got an email from Andre Shertek and he's like, I was gonna give a talk using SageMath Cloud and I can't because the machine that my project's running on isn't working. And it wasn't working because the network switches failed and that's just gonna happen. And that just took down the entire cluster of computers in the math building. And so um, I came up with a pretty good design for avoiding single points of failure, making it so that when you create a project, the files are replicated around to various machines in distinct locations. And I implemented it, and um, it wasn't so good, so then I tried that again. I came up with a really amazing design using ZFS, the Zetabyte file system from Sun, um, which worked in theory beautifully, um, worked in testing, like when, you tried out, when I tried out you know, miniature versions really well, but the thing I didn't realize is that with CFS, if you try to do like 10 things at once, they all become very, very slow, uh, at least under Linux. There's, it is absolutely terrible um, with dealing with contention. Um, ZFS was only recently ported to Linux and uh, only considered stable and for use about a year ago. I guess maybe two years ago now. But just because something, anyways, um, I made a major mistake, I guess, in retrospect in using ZFS, and that caused a lot of suffering. And also just migrating the data out from that backend format was really freaking hard. So in any case, I got rid of all that, and in April, I launched a new storage backend, which, uh, I don't know, it took like three rewrites again in various different ways of trying to use ZFS or other systems, and I settled on something that does now work really well. Um, and uh, ZFS, by the way, not to knock ZFS, if you know how to use it, it's, it's my favorite file system, it's amazing. And you just have to be good at using it. They've also put a huge amount of effort into it. There was a new release 
like a week ago in which they fixed hundreds of bugs and improved a lot of contention issues. But, um, and I mean, it's an old mature file system, but porting it to Linux involved a lot of issues. So there's that. And right now, the main um, stuff that's going on is just general quality improvements, trying to fix every known bug. Um, and there's a little bit of new functionality. For example, there's now a to-do list or task list type functionality, which will be important. Um, I'm planning to build a lot of other things on top of that, like homework assignments and stuff. Um, but it's uh, also just useful to have a list of things that you want to do. So that helps for organization. And there's an interesting story behind how that works as well. Okay, so um, a quick summary of features before I give you a 15 minute demo. So uh, Sage Math Cloud SMC is a website where you can use uh, essentially all free open source math software. I'm not aware of any free open source math software you can't use with it. Be if there was any, let me know so I can add it. It's just behind the scenes, it's just Ubuntu 1404. So anything that can be installed on x86 Ubuntu 14.04 can and will be made available there. Um, people request stuff that isn't installed very rarely now. They did a lot at the beginning, but it's kind of, maybe it's because there aren't enough new users, but um, most things are installed. So it's a pretty uh, large amount of things are installed. Um, what Some things you can do, you can collaboratively edit IPython notebooks and Sage worksheets. What I mean by that is it's like Google Docs where you can have a whole bunch of people editing the same file at once and you see everybody else's cursors and that sort of thing. Um, and you can also edit Logitech documents and similarly you can you know, have several people at once. There's inverse and forward search. Um, there's sage mode, or sage mode, sorry. It's not sage mode, but um, sage tech. So you can put backslash sage in a Logitech formula and it will evaluate the sage code and embedded in your LaTeX document, and it just works, which can often be painful to set up in practice on your own machine. Um, you can write and compile programs written in most languages. So if you want to write a Java program or a C program or whatever, you can just open a file and edit it and then compile it on the command line. It's not super user friendly yet, but it will be. Um, and there's a lot of little like, these are features, but there's a lot of little issues still with the feel of having multiple people using something at once. Um, one of the issues is it's pretty, it can be hard to test having multiple people do stuff at once when, so I, like, I've done all the development for this since the start, and so like testing multiple people at once is usually me banging on two keyboards. <laughs> and it's not a really good simulation. Um, I have a bunch of laptops set up on my desk at home, and I like, set up a little network and do stuff, but um, uh, a few days ago I hired these three guys who are UW students, and uh, we're often meeting in one room together and then you know, trying to do stuff and then you immediately start seeing issues with collaboration that you might not notice otherwise. Um, so that's been very helpful. And then there's task lists to keep track of your work. Okay, so now I'll show you a demo that illustrates some of these features and then I'll just give you some more insight into where things are going and what some of the issues are. Okay. So I made a um, project for this workshop, and I invited many of you um, to that project. It's called Sage Days June UW. So the way you would make such a project is you click on New Project. Uh, I'm going to zoom this out a little so that it shows the desktop view. So you click on New Project, you type a title and a description, click Create Project, and in a few seconds, you'll see a project listed in your list of projects. I have a very long list of projects. Um, so there's tags, but look at my list of projects. And then that's only my first, you know, so many. So I guess I have, I'm a collaborator on probably 250 projects at least. I don't even know how many. There's a lot. Um, so when you make an account here, you can make an, right now an unlimited number of projects. Um, so I'll click here. Notice, by the way, it lists all the collaborators on the project right here. So I'll click here. And um, so, give me, an overview of, oh, give me an overview of this. So this is the current view that you get when you open a project. It has a couple of tabs across the top. By the way, you can open multiple projects at the same time. You'll just get additional tabs across the top. So if you click on files, you see all of your files. Right now, I just have one directory. Um, recent will show files that you've recently opened on that computer. Uh, new allows you to create new files. You can just drag and drop files from your desktop computer or whatever computer you're using. 
You can also type the name of the file and then click on one of these buttons to create that type of file. So for example, you can create a Sage worksheet, an IPython notebook, a LaTeX document, a terminal, which is a full X term, color X term, or a to-do list, a task list. And you can also make um, any other type of file, like if you just want to make a couple of uh, Python files and some C programs and so on, you just type a file name in like foo.py and then click file or just hit return and it will create that type of file, uh, which I just did. And then once you've made the file, um, you can just start editing it. So I'm making a little, oh, there's account settings right here. And um, in the account settings, you can do things like change your password, change the email address that your account is linked to, change um, the theme for your terminal. There's lots of different color schemes. And you can also, there's a whole bunch of different settings for the editor. Um, the editor is, code here, and it has quite a few features. So you can see some of them here. There are key bindings for, uh, there's some standard key bindings that Codener has. There are also now Sublime um, key bindings, Vim key bindings, and Emacs key bindings. Um, there's also lots of features like whether you want smart indent, I that off for some reason. Um, auto brackets, matching brackets, deleting trailing white space, etc. Oh, and also there are many color schemes. So you can see the themes that are here. Um, people write these for code mirror and then I just add them. And you can see that I'm just using the default color scheme here. Um, if we go back to the file list, you'll see that the file I just created is here. I can click on it and um, continue editing it. Oops. So this is a function. So this is just a um, Python file that we're editing in the web browser. Now I'm going to click New again and make a terminal. So I don't care what it's called, so I'll just click on Terminal. And now I have a command line terminal. So I can type ls, and I see my files. Notice there's some color. Um, I can use vi and open that file foo.py if I want. And here it is. So that's vi. Um, it prints it input. I can save the file here. If I look at the file over here, um, within a couple of seconds, it'll notice that it changed on the file system and then read the changed version automatically. I can then go back here and then do something like I could type ipython if I wanted and then do import foo, foo.f of 10. And it runs it. Foo.f question mark. So, if you're used to using um, a traditional command line plus editor environment on your computer, then you'll be able to use this as well over the web. But a neat thing is that if somebody else were to connect to this project, they could see the same terminal, they could see exactly what I'm typing, they could type things in, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know, could somebody connect to this project? Because many of you, if you're on this list, you're, you can just uh, open the project and open the terminal. Um, if you want to open something that somebody else recently opened, click on log, and you'll see in order all the things that people opened. And this is searchable. You can type like term here and it shows only the terms that people opened and so on. So if I go over here, uh, maybe you could do something. Uh, sure. Just type something. Yep. So, um, so you can see how people can collaborate this way. And if you open foo.py, maybe you could do that. Maybe you could. Um, out of doc streamers. So, so I can see that he opened it because it's. Uh, oh, actually, Susan opened it. Yeah. Uh, Susan. There, we go. there you are. Can you do I something? Got, I got an invalid syntax error. For what? For open foo.py. That's because you typed open foo.py as a command to IPython. Oh, I did. Yeah. yeah. But if you type bang open foo.py, it'll work. Oh, fancy. Okay. So you, you can try that if you want. Um, it did. It's open yep. right here. Slowly. Now you can see she's typing here. And there's also a chat right here. So you can type hi, Susan. Maybe you can, you should see a little icon on the right. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you click yeah. on that, you can then say something back. In 
and you would type in the bottom right and just hit enter. And it does math as well, so uh, you can type x cubed plus e to the power of sine of x. It does full law tech or ASCII math type study. Right um, and the chat log itself, it's just a file that starts with dot. So if we exit out of this, there's a file dot foo sage, let's see, pi, foo dot pi sage chat. It has one line for each of our chat messages, and it's um, in JSON format. So I made, a ch I chatted, and here's what I said. Hi, Susan, etc. So if you wanted, if you were like working with some files and you want to use revision control or have backups or whatever, um, everything, the chats, everything is all plain text files on the file system. So it's kind of neat because that's kind of, I don't know, certain people appreciate that. It's not at all what you get from Google Docs, but it is what you get. And if you wanted to like add a chat programmatically, you could just cat it to the end of this file. This file is also just a synchronized document like any of the others. And it'll, this chat will actually notice that the file changed and put the message in there. So you can programmatically cat things to the end. Okay, I'm just going to quickly show you a few of the other file types that you can edit. So another one is a Sage Worksheet. So a Sage Worksheet, initially it looks exactly like just editing Python code. Um, there are no, there's no notion of cells or a whole bunch of different editors or anything like in the Sage Note, the classical Sage Notebook or IPython. Um, it's just a document. But when you hit Shift Enter, it evaluates all the code from the last place where it evaluated some code. Um, so now, and then it shows the output right here, um, right below where you evaluate the code. And it is, of course, it supports very rich output, like um, doing plots and that sort of thing, as you can see. And that's an SVG, or should be an SVG graphic by default. Let's see, copy image URL. Uh, yeah, dot SVG, it says right in the middle. So there's that. So you can draw plots and so I'll make this one a little better. Um, and do other things like at interact if you want to make it make things interactive. G is F -E -K it's kind of ugly the way I'm doing this, but So you get a little thing and then you can you know, change it. And it won't work until it's valid input. What is going on? It seems to have broken it. I sent a whole bunch of, I impatiently sent a whole bunch of things at once and I it up. Okay. So I'm just doing, you know, little things with the interact. So it's just, it's kind of um, different than the other worksheets, but the advantage of this approach, and it's just one approach, is that you can do things like the following. If you want to do <coughs> highlight a whole bunch, um, let's make, let's include a static plot. So let's say I want to just highlight a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'll just do Command A, for example, and then Command C to copy, and then I can just make another worksheet. And you know, I'm playing around with this other worksheet, and I can just paste in everything from the other one. So it's just like a normal document. You can just copy a range of input and output from one place, maybe cut it from one place, paste it on another place, and it just works nicely. Yeah, see, that didn't work because I hadn't evaluated F yet. But if I then evaluated F, then it does work. So it's, it's nice because you just get a single unified document. So that's how Sage Worksheets work. Um, some other types, let's see, uh, LaTeX. So this is a LaTeX document. And you? Yes? Uh, so when you space it all yes. to the border, does it paste the links to the same file, or it actually made the copy of the plot as well? Neither. So what has happened? Okay, magic trick. Um, and it's a pretty amazing magic trick because, look, if I go to a completely different project, uh, oh God, there's so many. Um, if I go to a completely different project, make a new worksheet, 
and paste. Oh, I didn't have a plot, but let's uh, let me copy the plot again. Watch this. So let's say I, I grab this, go to this completely different project, and then paste it. There it is. So what it does is when you draw a plot, it creates a file. It then sends it and it's stored in a distributed database, in a um, key value store in a database. The key is the SHA, uh, I, think the sh I think it's the SHA-1 hash of the contents of the file. And the value is the actual file, which is a couple of, in this case, probably like 30K. And it's just a UUID, and now anyone can access it via that. Um, there's a UUID associated to the SHA-1 hash, and anyone can access it from any project. So, so it's shared bit bin users as well? Yes. It's just, I mean, it's really just defined by it. Because the hash is because you don't have hash collisions, it's just defined by that hash. It's kind of like a permalink or something, more or less. Um, but it's really just the the hash of the plot. So actually, for a thousand uh, users, will try this uh, plot sign from a tutorial. Is it yep. only one copy? That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Except for random. I mean, plot sign is um, there's some randomization in our in the way our plot happens to work. So it in fact they would get a thousand different plots of sign. But assuming the random seed were the same. They would all be just grabbing the same image. It would never actually store it in the database except for the very first time. So it's very nice. You can take a worksheet, put the plain text of it with no images on GitHub, have somebody else pull it, and they get all the images already because they're just uh, references to some global database. So, so it means that another user can, well, in a way, if he knows the hash of some yes. file that you've done, he, he gets well, it an image. It on, this is only used for, uh, I think, images and worksheets. Okay. Um, yeah. This is primarily used for images and worksheets, and that's it. But you don't. There's no way you're going to know the hash of, and, well, something. Yeah, like no, I know. Yeah. I know, but I mean, if, if somehow yeah. I know the hash of, so yeah. of an image that you produced, I can. Absolutely. Have it. Yes. You have much better things that you can do with that knowledge than reproduce one image and save, yeah. right? Well, you can <laughs> forge international bank transfers. No, no, no. It's, I'm not thinking of it as a security issue. It's yeah. just like that's the information you need to yeah. you know, share with somebody to share an image with them, yeah. which can be useful. Oh, yes. but, yeah. Um, I think it's, I mean, I thought a lot about this design and I, I like it, um, as it turns out. Because it, it's really the difference between everybody having their own little uh, installs on their own computers where you have to have the copies of the files and all this extra stuff versus there's one global database that everybody has access to. So I'm, I'm sorry, that these it, are it also doesn't save it permanently to the database unless you save the worksheet. When you save the worksheet, it goes through and looks at all the things that are referenced, referenced and they get saved permanently. Um, otherwise, things are only saved for like 24 hours. So, um, yeah. This database, can a user has permissions to see the list of the database? Or no. Just so if you just yeah. happen to know the hash, you can yeah. access it. If you, there's no way to get a list of the hashes okay. um, for users. Um, and there's, yeah. Yes? Within the this worksheet, there's there are ways to put in uh, uh, rich text. And yes, text. yeah. Um, so right now, you're using a worksheet and you want to put some markdown, you just put percent %md. And then you type stuff like, uh, this is stuff, uh, can I think of anything to type? Right. You can just do markdown like that. Um, you can do HTML, uh, that. And there's a whole bunch of other things. There's a command percent magics, which lists all these magics that are available. And you can set a default one using percent default mode. Um, make a homework problem using percent exercise. Uh, percent fork is kind of neat. It lets you uh, have a cell that will take a long time to run, have it start going, and you can still work with other cells at the same time. And when the one that takes a long time to run finishes, it'll set some variable in your original session. So that's kind of neat. Um, and you know, for, percent four chan, percent gap, etc. All the old ones that you know about already. So there's a whole bunch of these types of things. Um, I want to add, but haven't got around to it. Uh, what you see is what you get with editing this. What happens with these right now is you double click on them. By default, for example, percent MD will hide its input when you hit shift enter or command enter. Um, unless you say hide equals false, and then they will 
not hide their input. So, um, but then you double click to toggle whether or not the input is hidden. But it would be very nice to have a way to edit, like a little icon or something, or at least at the very minimum at the beginning, an icon at the top where you can edit the WYSIWYG content. And um, probably Tiny MCE again would be a good way to go with that because it's uh, continued to improve. Um, although it's very oriented towards editing HTML rather than Markdown. But, um, of course, the HTML is also supported. And of course, you can put math here and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and I'm constantly adding new things, like I added a Go mode um, for the Go programming language. And it's really easy to add these percent modes. All you have to do is write a function that takes as input a string. That's it. And then it just, if you, do, if you make a function foo that takes a string as input, uh, yeah, here it is. So this is an example of go mode. So I'll show you the code for it. Well, yeah, it's, maybe it's complicated. It started out simple. But like if you want to do a hello world programming go, you just do percent go. It actually switches the syntax highlighting mode to be the proper go syntax highlighting. And then it um, builds your program using go and displays the output. And as soon as that is done, it will show the source code of the Go command. Um, so there, it actually, that hello world is produced using Google's Go language. Um, and here's the source code of the Go interface. So it just writes some code to a file, runs it, and then deletes the file that it wrote to. That's it. Um, so if you want to write your own percent mode, like for my talk, I wrote a percent slide mode that just uh, adds some extra space and does some CSS stuff. Okay, the next thing, um, LaTeX. So here's a LaTeX document. You can zoom in and out, move it around, um, you know, change stuff. Oops, I have to save it. it right now, LaTeX on save, but um, there have been requests to change that to shift enter or something. Um, after you LaTeX, it'll load a new preview. First time, should usually be pretty fast, but evidently it isn't at the moment, which is annoying. Um, Still waiting for the preview to appear. The um, thing on the right is a PNG image. And my test case when I was writing this was a 150 page book. So, and I was doing the editing on a computer with very little memory on a Chromebook. So um, you can actually handle full books with this, although it currently doesn't have good support for multiple files. So it works really well if your whole book is in one file, or you're, you have the patience to edit the build command appropriately. You can customize it just by editing it right here. Um, if there are errors, like let's make an error right here. Uh, forget to put math mode in. It's pretty easy to make an error. Um, it'll show you a list of your errors. You can click on this button, and you go to the corresponding point in the text. If you click on the other button, it takes you to that point in the document. You can also double click. Um, at points in the document, and it takes you to the corresponding point in the text. And you can go to a point in the text and click forward, um, or shift click, I think, and that'll take you to this point over here. So you have forward and inverse search. Is this a Beezer's math book built into it? Uh, not, yet. not yet. I guess not yet. <laughs> but, um, We'd be close, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what we want. Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, it'd be nice to have other similar editing modes that, to this one. So that's tech. Um, so when you say it doesn't do multiple files, what yeah, about bibliographies? Oh, those are fine. What it doesn't allow you to do is have a whole bunch of different tech files that um, all get included in one big one. Because when you try to edit the other ones, it doesn't know how to draw the preview properly. I, there, Harold pointed out some way to do it. I just ha haven't got around to making it really automatic. So, um, yeah. But bibliographies, it'll, not only will it do them fine, it'll automatically run bib tech. So you, don't, you never have to worry about running Dip tech or any of the other stuff. It just automatically gets run. Um, and Sage tech as well. So if I go uh, use package Sage tech, what's it's called, um, consider uh, factor 2014. So what that should do is run Sage. Notice it says Sage right there. So it's automatically running Sage and tech and Sage again. And now it'll update the preview. Um, it seems to be a little slow, but here it is. And you'll notice it's factored the current year. 
So that's normally a, like a three pass deal. Yeah, and so it did do the three happen. passes there. Just, sure, yeah. But it just knows to do them. Yeah. And if there's BibTech, it'll do that automatically. Is it possible to turn it off? To turn if what I off? have a Sage uh, code in my file that takes quite a bit to run, mm -hmm. can it uh, not run it unless I really want it? It is not possible to turn it off yet. Yeah, I don't think it's possible. You can customize the PDF, like the command it runs to tech, but it looks in the output to see whether uh, Sage Tech needs to be run. And if it does need to be run, then it will run it. So it's currently not possible to just tell it not to. Um, but uh, that could be added. I don't think it would be hard to add that. That's an easy feature. Um, and the actual, there's a lot of work that goes in to be able to click and have the thing jump to the right point. And it's done right using sync tech. OK, so that's tech. Um, let see, terminals, OK, uh, IPython notebooks. Maybe this doesn't take too long to open. Here it is. So this is IPython embedded in here. And uh, it's not upgraded to IPython 2 yet, but that's extremely high on my priority list. Um, and one of the neat things about the IPython support, the main thing that I spent a lot of time working on is making it so that you can have multiple editors at the same time. So if I open this in another browser, then I can make changes to it. So I have to, it's kind of hard to see, so I have to somehow, oh, it's in full screen mode, so. Yeah, okay, so that's one browser, that's another browser, and they look identical, but if I type here, then when you look at the other one, it's changed. And you can see my little cursor there. Um, so I do something there, and then I change to the other one, and it's changed there. You have multiple people at once. Um, and uh, that's being able to do that throughout every part of the Sage Math Cloud in every possible place is one of the basic design goals of the system, which informs how the decision making is made about how to do things. I don't claim that it's successfully done anywhere or everywhere, but it's a goal. Okay, and then the last thing is uh, task lists. And so here's the task list functionality. Um, it's basically a to do list, so do some stuff. Oh, it's really tiny, isn't it? Um, OK, so do some stuff. So you just uh, type here. It's arbitrary markdown, so.